can people hear me? Is this, is this working? Is this on? All right. Hi, guys. Um, welcome back. I hope you all had a lovely weekend. Anyone do anything fun? No? What? Oh, yes. Lunar New Year. Happy late Lunar New Year for those of you who celebrate it. Um, woo. Yes. Um, okay, so Fisher and I only have like one or two quick announcements before we get into lecture today. Lecture today is about debugging. Um, debugging is specifically a very hard concept to teach and also a very hard concept to learn because it's kind of one of those things you learn by doing. But I'm going to, so the strategy I'm gonna take here is by presenting a case study, we're gonna actively debug something on the board because um, there's, no real, there's no real method, you just kind of do it. Um, but before, before, we, before we get to that, um, First of all, subject evals are out for IAP. Please, please, please fill them out. Even if you hate us, like if you hate us, we wanna know. If you like us, we also wanna know. Hopefully you've liked us, but if you hate us, it's also very useful information. Um, uh, the other reason we're very much asking you to please fill out subject evals is because one of the reasons for this course is to show the department that people want to learn hardware design. It is a useful thing to teach and like, we should teach more hardware design in better ways. Um, so the more of you fill out subject emails, the more we can shove it in their face. Anyway, um, <laughs> Fisher. Yes, to make this even better. Um, yeah, um, and do you want to talk about design reviews? All right, cool. All right, so let's get into um, lecture for today, which is, I'm gonna call it interrogating your circuit with agent Rick Dicker. Um, I'm not Rick Dicker, but he's cool. Um, so debugging is very much a concept of interrogating your circuit. You ask, the point is to ask a lot of questions. Something's gonna go wrong. You're gonna notice it's gone wrong, and you're gonna stand there going like, why? For many minutes. And it's about asking the right questions and probing the right places on your circuit to get answers. And I'm gonna try to do that um, with a case study. Um, for those of you who have less experience in electronics, debugging is very difficult, especially when you don't understand basic circuit concepts. A lot of it is applying what you, have know, what you know and you have learned in previous systems to the things that you are trying to debug in front of you. Um, so it is a little intimidating. You will be doing a little bit of it in lab, but don't worry because really the best way to get good at debugging is practice. And the more you debug, well, the more things will go wrong and then the more you get to learn. Um, so I'm gonna start with, the step one in debugging is just understanding your system. And people probably know what example I'm gonna use um, because I've used it in about three lectures and we're gonna stick with the example because it's a, actually a very good example, which is the solar car battery management system. Um, I know, huge surprise. <laughs> um, but, so let's start with this. What does a battery management system have to do? Let's start by understanding the system in a, in a little bit more detail. What does a BMS have to do? I got a measure voltage coming out of a battery. What else? Turn it off if something goes wrong. Did I see a hand over here somewhere? Conditioning? No? Okay. What else? All okay. right. So, um, the solar car battery management system does a bunch of things, and the way it tells us what it's doing is by throwing errors. So, here are the errors that the solar car battery management system throws. 
And this is also how we can tell a little bit what the battery management system is doing. So if it throws an E1, that's an e-stop error. What that means is it's not turning the car on because you have the e-stop pressed. Number two is an under-voltage lockout error. An under-voltage lockout basically means the battery is too low in voltage for it to turn on. It wants you to charge the battery up because remember, lithium battery cells have to stay within a minimum and a maximum voltage range. If you go below the minimum voltage range, you damage the cell. If you go above the maximum voltage range, it explodes. So error number two is under voltage. It's read the battery voltage. It said your battery voltage is too low. Error number three is the opposite. That's an over voltage uh, lockout, which basically is saying your battery is too full and you need to discharge it. So that might sound weird to you, right, in the sense of if your battery is too full, um, you should turn the battery on so you can discharge more. But also remember that like the battery management system is something you use to charge the battery with as well. So if I connect a power supply to charge up the battery, the way the battery has decided I'm going to accept no more energy into me is um, an E3 over voltage lockout and it will open up its contactors and then shut off. Um, another thing, uh, I'm going to draw this on the board in a second, but we have a solar array that charges the battery. The solar array is providing too much power. It will also throw an E3 over voltage lockout and isolate the array from the battery so we can just discharge instead of charging. E4, overcurrent lockout, which is basically you are running way too much current through the system to the point where you're about to damage cells or it's going to heat up too much. There's a safe current threshold. If it senses too much current, maybe the motor has stalled or maybe something else weird is going on or there's a short somewhere in the circuit, it will throw open the contactors and protect you from also exploding. The nice part about batteries is we know the failure mode. They will blow up no matter what you do. Um, over temperature protection, if it gets too hot, an E6 is a communications error. If you're interested in what that means, we can talk about it later. It's a little bit too much nitty gritty for lecture right now, but basically it has to do with the way we measure things in the battery. So, this is what the solar car BMS looks like. Um, we, have, we have the BMS right here in the middle. Actually, I'm going to draw it like this, sorry. Um, BMS right here in the middle. Um, we are going to connect the battery cells themselves to this side. So this is my input voltage. Then I have a couple of lines going on in the system. I have my battery positive line, which goes to switch number one and switch number two. And I have my battery negative line, which has switch number three. And that outputs, this is, ugh, sorry, plus and minus goes to solar array. Plus and minus goes to motor. So solar array dumps power in through this switch. And there's a common ground switch. And the motor draws power out through this port. Everyone following me so far? We have three switches. Um, and basically, what the system does, if it reads any of the errors that we saw on the previous slide, it will open all of the switches. It'll be like, I'm just going to disconnect everything. I have no idea what's going on. And that's the point of a BMS. So now you've understood this a little bit. Does anybody have questions on exactly what the BMS is going to do in a situation where where like there's an issue going on with the car. I know we've talked about the BMS a lot, so hopefully people don't have questions, but if you have questions, now is a good time to clarify. Yeah? Okay. So, what I'm gonna try to do for the rest of this lecture is I'm going to show you, a, I'm gonna describe to you a phenomenon that we observed was happening with the solar car battery while like during one of the stages of debugging, and we're gonna go step by step through the schematic and try to figure out what was the problem. And how did, we, how did we test things and how did we figure out what was going on. So, um, this is the schematic of the BMS. It is, um, 
Okay, somewhere in my lecture slides, there's a link to this PDF. Um, if you can't see this, I would pull it up because uh, I'm gonna be referring to it a lot. Um, but yes, now that we've identified the problem, we have to fix the problem. Um, no, step two is identify the problem, sorry. Now we're gonna identify the problem. I'm gonna tell you what we observed. So, what if I told you I have this system with my battery connected and I turn on the car and I immediately get an overcurrent error. I turn on, I've done nothing, the car's not moving, not doing anything, I plug the battery in, I turn on the car, all these switches close, this switch closes, this switch closes, this switch closes, in, closes and then I immediately get E4, too much current. We'll get there, yes, kind of, but where, where, where do I start? What are pos where do I start when I'm debugging a system like this? Like, what is the first thing you, because like, we have a lot of theories. One could be the capacitors aren't being charged correctly. And if you don't know, one could be a short. Maybe there's a short somewhere in the circuit. How would I, what's the first step I would take to figure out which of these things is causing the problem? Say that louder. Right, but how do I figure that out? Yes, but before that, what do I do? Before I start looking at the circuit, what do I do? Unplug it. Unplug the solar array, unplug the motor. Check if I get an error. In this case, I didn't get an error. What do I do? Oh, yeah, first we cry, and then we, we, unplug, we unplug both the motor and the array. See if we get an error four. In this case, we didn't. Then what do I do? Looking at this diagram. I've unplugged both. I wanna figure out, so I have, I have unplugged both, and I have no error, which means the error is here or the error is here. So what do I do? Plug it back in. So I start with the solar array. I plug the solar array back in. I check, do I get an E4? I unplug the solar array. I plug the motor back in. I check, do I get an E4? So turns out when I did that, I get an E4 in two cases. Either if the solar array I'm gonna use, this is, is plugged in. The solar array is plugged in. Whether the motor is plugged in or not, I get an E4 if I turn on, because I can turn on the motor independently from the array here, right? I can tell it, I have three switches, I can tell it motor turn on, I can tell it array turn on. I got an E4 when I turned the motor on. or I turn the array on if the array was plugged in, whether the motor was connected or not. Now you should probably be looking at this like, what the, why? Where did this even, what is going on, right? Yeah, so did we. This is confusing, because in my head, what should have happened, right, is if I plug in the array, and I turn the array on, I should have gotten E4. But if the motor isn't plugged in, and I turn the motor on, or if I, the, or if I turn, yeah. The array, I shouldn't get an E4, right? That's weird. Because I've only plugged the array in. So, what's the next step in trying to figure out, what's the next step in trying to figure out what's, uh, what's going on here? So I've observed basically, I can say the problem is the array, right? If I plug the array in, I get an error. What's the next step? I've plugged, I've plugged the solar array in, there's an error. Now what do I do? I see a mouthing of an answer. Yeah, you start, de you start debugging the array. Um, 
But the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna look at the array, right? Like what is, what is the array made of? The solar array is made of a whole bunch of solar cells that go into what we call an MPPT solar charge controller, which goes into the BMS. All this is saying is I have a solar array, I need something that converts the power from what it outputs to something the battery management system likes, and then it feeds it into the battery. That's all this is. This is a big intelligent power converter. But I'm getting an overcurrent error somewhere in this system, right? So where are my possible problems? What could be a problem here? Can I have a problem here? in this solar array MPPT stack up that's not on the battery management system? Can I have an issue here? Is it possible? Yeah, I can, right? I don't know, is it here? Or is it on the BMS? I can also have a problem on the BMS, right? So how do I figure out whether my problem is here or my problem is here? You could plug in a power supply to your battery management system and isolate any problems from the array, or check the current leaving the MPPT. Probe, unplug this, probe here. See if the output is correct or not, right? Because if I'm a designer of the system, right, I know that this solar panel will produce some open circuit voltage, right, when it's connected. I know that I expect some voltage here, and I expect some voltage here that, is, that I will define as correct if nothing is, like, nothing is wrong with the system. And the solar array hopefully powers itself, because if not, it would be pretty useless. So I'm gonna unplug the solar array, I'm gonna take a multimeter, I'm gonna probe my voltage here, and see, is this correct, or is it not correct? And that's my sanity check, that's my sanity check. Is this, does this work or does it not work, right? So I probe the voltage here, it tells me the voltage. We probe the voltage, we did that. Probe the voltage, it tells me, oh no, it disappeared. It's 160 volts, which I'm gonna define as correct. In our case, 160 volts is exactly what we expected coming out of the solar array because of how many, so solar arrays, how they work is each panel will produce a voltage. So I think it's like 1.3 volts. 1.3 volts per panel. We had a certain number in series that we knew and a certain number in parallel that we knew and we knew that was gonna output if you do that math there, if you know how many cells you have in series, you can figure out your, your voltage that you expect from your panel. So we expected 160 volts, we got 160 volts, so we can't fully conclude that nothing's going wrong with this side of the circuit, but as an initial check, we can guess that maybe this side of the circuit is not the problem. Another way you can tell which side of the circuit is the problem, ask which side of the circuit have you designed? And which side of the circuit has somebody else designed? Nothing here was anything we designed. It was designed by professionals in industry, so this is probably the problem. Okay, so the BMS is the issue. Now that the BMS is the issue, what do we do? Somebody over here said it earlier. I have an entire PCB that could be the problem. Where do I start? Is that a hand? Aww. Anyone on this side of the room? Look at my circuit. Schematic. Open your schematic. You would not believe how big a barrier opening a PDF schematic is to people for debugging. Open your schematic and look at it. 
because this is the circuit, right? This is what it, this, it's doing something, and all of the parts in here are going to do something. And we're gonna look at these parts one by one to try to figure out where could the problem be. So, this is our circuit. What is that? What is that? Why is it here? What are all of these things? Somebody tell me, what is this part of the circuit doing? You said it before, but you didn't know you said it. That half of my circuit, hint, has something to do with capacitors. It's a precharge circuit. Thank you. What is a precharge circuit? Not lower voltage, but you're close. So a precharge circuit. A precharge circuit. So let me look at my motor controller briefly. Inside my motor controller, I have all these wires that are going to my motor. I have my three three bridge, my sorry, my three MOSFET bridges doing my doing my switching. And I have a whole bunch of power electronics in here. And for those of you who've been looking at the schematics and kind of trying to figure out what is in them, if I have power electronics, what are, what are other components that are always associated with power electronics? What are components that always sit next to my power converters on the input and output? And I have chip. what is this component called? No. My what is this component called? <laughs> Bypass capacitors, thank you. Okay, so all power electronics, all power electronic systems, especially high power electronic systems, have massive capacitors sitting on the input and output of my circuit because of filtering purposes. I want my system to have smooth voltages, and also in the sense of a motor controller, if I, if I, like let's say the motor suddenly needs to pull a massive amount of current that the battery can't supply, it can pull it from these large capacitors that are sitting in here. Those are called bus capacitors, okay? Bus capacitors because they sit on your power bus. So let's say I take a battery, right? And it's a massive battery. It's a 130 volt, like 200 amp rated battery. And I connect it to this big boy capacitor. What happens? gets very upset, right? I got a massive current spike because I'm charging, I'm trying to charge this big capacitor very, very, very quickly. And there's nothing to stop me. So in a lot of electrical, um, like electric vehicles and especially systems with like large capacitors, frankly, everything should have a pre-charged circuit, but there's some things where you can get away with it because the capacitance is not big enough. You have what's called a pre-charged circuit. G. Um, I have a big switch. This big switch is the thing that really connects, here's my battery, to my motor controller. I have a big switch over here that I'm controlling. Oftentimes you will hear this referred to as either a relay, but more commonly in electric vehicle systems it's called a contactor. A contactor is just a massive relay that's rated for high current. And what I'll do is I'll say, okay, before I turn this on, I wanna make sure that big boy over here is nice and charged up so that I don't get massive current surges going through my system. So I'll put a smaller switch here 
and a very large uh, or a medium size, medium to large size resistor. And now, if I want this capacitor of capacitance value C to charge up in a certain amount of time, how do I size my resistor? 6002, friends. Time constant of my capacitor is equal to the resistor times the capacitance. And this is my two-thirds, two-thirds charge time. So what the microcontroller over here, my little brain, is doing is saying, turn on the switch for roughly tau amount of time. Charge up my capacitor, and then close my big switch. Some electric vehicle systems will reopen this after it's closed. Some will leave it closed because not a lot of current is going to go through here if you have a resistor and you have this main large power bus going like this. It's kind of really up to design principle at that point. Um, most people leave it closed. Um, just because they don't want the risk of, I don't know, something weird happening, like contact or opening, closing, what's up? Yes, yes. Yeah, these capacitors filter the output of the power supply or they're to help the motor controller during current spikes or during regen. Um, and then you don't want to connect a battery to an empty power supply, empty massive capacitor without a resistor in between it. So it starts by charging, and then it connects the main circuit. Yeah? yeah. Cool. So let me think. Could that be a problem? Could that be explaining my current overcurrent error? It could if it was broken, right? Like, if, like don't assume anything works, especially if you've designed it. And that, that's not to say you're not wonderful. You are all wonderful, but we all make mistakes. Um, that could be broken. What else could be broken? So, like, option number one is my pre, there's something wrong with my pre-charge circuit. My capacitor isn't pre-charging, and when I close this contactor, big current spike, the battery detects that, and it goes, nope, too much current, shuts off, right? That's option number one. What's option number two? What else could be going on? A whole another, I have like all, this entire half of the board we haven't talked about at all. What else could be going on? What's this? This thing in between ground and ground. What does that do? Any takers? How about this side of the room? What is that? Guess. Someone say it over here. What is it? This component, this IC, this, this U11 IC. What is it? It's in series with my, with my output line. What is it? It's a current sensor. I have to read current to determine if I'm, like, if I have too much current, if my battery is deciding whether I have too much current or not, I need to read the current. Therefore, there has to be a current sensor somewhere in the circuit. So this is my current sensor. Could that be a problem? Absolutely. If it's giving me something ridiculous at the output, then maybe it's a problem, maybe it's not a problem. That's something we have to check. And I've also circled that K4 CON12. What is that? We've talked about We've talked about this. We've talked about the current sensor that sits right here. So we've talked about this circuit up here, which is pre-charged. We've talked about the uh, current sensor that sits right here. What else in this circuit have I not talked about yet? The contactor, which, how do current sensors work? Well, they sense current, thank you. But um, how do they sense current? Eight oh two friends. 
how do we sense current? That's one way to measure it. That's called a that's called a shunt resistor. That's not the way this sensor does it. Hall effect. So, if I have a current going through a wire, I have a B field proportional to my current. I don't know what the equivalency is. Um, but then we have a magnet sensor here that senses the magnetic field and outputs a voltage proportional to that magnetic field. Yeah? How does a relay work? Especially a massive relay like that. Any takers? Solenoid. solenoid. What's a solenoid? It's like the coil with the magnet. It's a magnet. I have input terminal of the contactor, actually. Input terminal, piece of metal on a hinge, output terminal, coil, act ex excitation coil, and a magnet. I turn the co coil on and the switch goes makes a very satisfying click sound if you've ever heard a contactor go off. But this uses magnetic field, and what if my current sensor is right here? What could happen to my current? Bad, bad things, right? So if I plot current as a function of time, I could get zeros. And depending on how fast my micro, I could get a spike in my magnetic field reading because it's so close to something that's producing a magnetic field, whether it's a current or not, I get a spike. And if my microcontroller is fast enough, th could this be causing my E4? Yeah, absolutely, right? This is, this is what we call electromagnetic interference. Somewhere either in the lecture five notes or the lecture four, like sometime in this past week, somewhere in the notes we linked a really great book by by Ott, what's his name? What's his first name? Ott is his last name, what's his first name? Henry, I think it's Henry Ott. It's like, great book on electro, it's, it, the entire book is on electromagnetic interference. And it's, it is the book on EMI, and it's great. Uh, so if you have circuits that are having EMI problems, definitely consult that book. But, point is, I have three possible locate problems in my circuit. What's the first thing, what's the first thing I do? I have, I have identified either pre-charge could be broken, right? My current sensor could be broken, or the relay could be causing interference with my current sensor, giving it an erroneous output. So how do I figure out which of these three things is the problem? Get a multimeter. What would I check? Tell me, where would I probe? I have my multimeter and my leads. I'm your lost robot. Tell your lost robot where to put its multimeter leads. What am I checking? You could, it's a little hard because like pre-charge that time constant tau from pre-charge, this is usually in the order of microseconds. It's not like, so the, the speed at which that capacitor is gonna charge up is like very quick. So I could sit there trying to watch my multimeter for three milliseconds, but I'm not, maybe you're that fast, I'm not that fast. Um, so I could check pre-charge, but how could I check pre-charge? Check if it connects. What I'm gonna do is disconnect everything from my circuit. Then I'm gonna tell the pre-charge to turn on. 
and I have this little pre-charge relay. Let's call this test point one and test point two, right? And I know the moment I turn on pre-charge, that relay should close. So what kind of tests can I run across these test points to figure out if that relay is closing? Continuity check. Take a multimeter. Here, here. Multimeter. And continuity check mode is the one that looks like, it looks like, I don't know, it's like, it looks like a sideways Wi-Fi signal. This is the one that's, that's like continuity test. Um, and then if you probe and you put the multimeter in continuity mode, and if it's connected, it'll go beep until you take it off. Okay, so I could do that. Um, I'll tell you the answer to the continuity check, whether it worked or not, in a minute. But let's talk about um, the other two. How could I test the other two? There's one test I can run to rule out both of those things, which is what? Billy? You could. There's a quicker way. Current sensors output an analog or digital signal. Analog. They output an analog signal, which means what wonderful tool in my arsenal can I use to check the output of an analog signal that's moving somewhat fast? Oscilloscope. So what I'm going to do is I have my current sensor that's connected to some, I don't know, nonsense over here. This is nonsense. We're going to not worry about it. And here's the output. And here's my ground. I'm going to take my oscilloscope. I'm going to connect the probe here and the ground probe here. And I'm going to read what the waveform looks like, right? I'm going to look at it and be like, does this make sense? So this specific current sensor is powered by a 5 volt rail. Most analog systems that are powered by, like you look at the power rail, will output a signal here at their output between the value of voltage at the ground and the value of voltage at your high level, at your, at your uh, power input. So I'm looking for a signal between zero volts and five volts on the output of my current sensor. Now, this current sensor can measure positive current and negative current which means if the current is zero, what should be the value? Anyone else? I know you know the answer, so what should be the value? I can measure negative current and positive current, which means zero has to be where? 2.5 volts, right in the middle. This is full positive current, this is full negative current, this is the signal I'm looking for. If I see an issue with the, like let's say the current sensor is totally blown and it's giving me 100 amps of current all the time, it'll look, it'll look like this, right? Or it'll look like this, which is wrong. Or when I turn on the contactor, what will I see? I drew it over there somewhere. And I can also look at my graph. If I, if I look at my coding, let's say my E4 error is at 40 amps, and 40 amps corresponds to, I don't know, this level, I can see, is it over and is it triggering? So I can, tell, I can take an oscilloscope, I can probe the output of my current sensor, um, do that. So what we decided to do was we decided to start by probing the output of the current sensor because it's a part we hadn't replaced in a while and sometimes they fail. And turns out that it was perfectly fine. It was sitting here at a nice 2.5 volts. We saw a very tiny ripple spike when we turned the contactor on. 
but nowhere near enough to cause an E4. And frankly, it's like it's an analog system. You will see some ripple when you turn the contactor on. It's not going to be negligible. Also, um, the reason we could be pretty confident is because we probed it. We also we took the current sensor. We put it through an LC filter usually just to get some of the noise out of the way, and we probed it before the filter. So if it's not a problem before the filter, it's definitely not going to be a problem after the filter, unless the filter's broken. But let's, for example, passives aren't really components that fail that often, so we, we decided to ignore the rest of the chain for now because we said, okay, the current sensor is probably working fine. And unless the capacitor has exploded recently, it's probably not a problem. So then we run this test. Can someone take a guess as to what the multimeter did when we put the two... Um, two test leads here and turned it on. That's not a problem. Where's the problem? Didn't connect. Didn't make a beep at all. And we were like, ha ha, hello. So that relay was not turning on. Because it had exploded. Um, Sad. Okay. But does that explain everything in my circuit? Does that explain all the problems I was having? It definitely explains some of them, right? So what I was gonna what I'm gonna do is So the issue was this is not the right color. Issue was E4 on startup. How are we doing on time? Great. Uh, so blown precharge relay means I'm not precharging which means, will I get a current spike when I turn on my battery? Absolutely yes. So, so what are we gonna do with this relay? Replace it. Replace it, yay. So now we're gonna figure out, now we, we replace it, I'll replace it, and it blew again immediately. Because our luck is great and electrons love you, and they want to do everything they tell you, you tell them to do. So now what's the problem? Because something is causing this relay to explode. What could be causing this relay to explode? check the output, right? First thing we did was check the output of the motor controller and the everything, and it was fine. If it was shorted, that would have been a problem, right? So that's not a problem. Let's look at the circuit. Um, here's, my, here's my coil that's inside. Let me draw, sorry be a little more explicit. Here's my relay. Here's my input terminal. Here's my switch. Here's my output terminal. Here is my magnet. Here is my coil. Here is where I give it 12 volts to turn on. Here is a diode. This goes to ground, and this is my activation signal. That's my circuit for the relay. Nothing else connected to it, except for maybe a bypass capacitor somewhere. So why is it blowing up? Maybe the diode's broken. What is, a di what is this? What what is this? 
Why is there a diode here? Flyback. Who here? Raise your hand if you know what flyback protection is. Raise your hand if you don't know what flyback protection is. Great. Wonderfully important concept of electrical engineering here. What is the voltage law for an inductor? So as a coil of wire in a solenoid is an inductor, right? What's the voltage law? Voltage negative L, D I D T. So, so, I'm sorry, I should have actually, there's a, there's a MOSFET here. Uh, this is wrong. This, is, this goes up to 12 volts, and there's signal. There's a MOSFET here that connects this point to ground to turn on the contactor. If I turn off the MOSFET, there's current flowing through this, there's current flowing through the circuit, right? Let's say it's on, there's current flowing through it. If I turn off the MOSFET, if I disconnect this inductor from the circuit while current is flowing through it, what happens? What's DIDT? Infinite. So my voltage is infinity, which means what happens to this and this and everything around it? We have a wonderful hand motion going on over there. It blows up. This blows up, and this blows up. And that's how my relay is exploding, if I have a bad diode. So how do I check if my diode is bad? What tool do I use and what test do I run? Multimeter and continuity. Multimeter, yes. Continuity, no. Has anyone looked at a multimeter before? There's a diode button on my multimeter. I take the positive lead of my multimeter, I stick it here. I take the negative lead of my multimeter, I stick it here. And what does the output tell me if I'm in dio mode? Does it tell me it's working or does it tell me something else? It tells you the reverse voltage drop. Did I flip this, Fisher? Is it positive lead here? Yeah, it's positive here, lead here, right? Yeah. Um, sorry, you go this way, and it tells you the forward voltage drop of your diode. You put the probe on it, it runs a current, and it detects the voltage drop. Because in lab one, you guys all saw that if I run current through a diode, there's a voltage drop across it. That's standard, pretty much. It checks the voltage drop. And if it gives me a voltage drop that matches the voltage drop of the data sheet within some percent, I can be confident that the diode works. But if I do this and it says, bro, what's voltage? Then I can be pretty sure my diode is blown, right? So I did that and it said, bro, what's voltage? So now what do I do? What do I replace? I replace... I replace my diode, and I replace my contactor, and I assume I'm going to be happy forever because this should work, right? Does anybody see any problems with this? I think this should work. Okay, we, we replaced the MOSFET. <laughs> yes. we, we also replaced the MOSFET, but I, I should be happy forever. This should work, right? Yeah, what caused the diode to blow? In this case, what caused the diode to blow was it was old and it was upset. Yes. Um, 
so we haven't actually we haven't actually fully figured out what caused the diode to blow. It's working now, but before before that, we replaced all this. I assume it should work, and then I turned the car on, and I immediately got what? What did I get? Yay! I still have an E4. Now what's wrong? Someone please tell me. I'm losing my mind. No, because I you don't have to start fully from the beginning because I know my pre-charged circuit works now. It's brand new. I've tested it. I've tested every component in it. I've tested the resistor. I've tested the MOSFET. I've tested the microcontroller. That's fine. So where's the problem? We tested the motor. The motor works. The array works. Also, I didn't design it. Now what? I'm still getting a large current spike, which means what side of the circuit am I on? That side works. I know it works now. What else could be wrong? It could be, but I don't know. I can't say for sure if it's EMI or not, but I can say for sure it's now this half of the circuit, right? So, so, what do I do? Let's say if the battery was causing a current problem, we would have much larger problems in that we would likely be on fire. So, Let's, let's call it that the battery is not the problem. <laughs> I'm gonna come back, what am I gonna do again? I've already run this test. Can I run a test I've already run? I can, I'm gonna do this again. And lo and behold, that's what I see on the oscilloscope. Now, why is there a current spike now? There wasn't before, but there is one now. I just fixed my relay, but it shouldn't do that. It should do, it should do this. I should see a little bit of current as the capacitor charges, and then it should be fine. It shouldn't do the massive spike. Now I'm gonna do what Billy suggested earlier, which is I'm gonna put another current sensor somewhere because I'm losing my mind. So I'm gonna put another current sensor like out here and see what that says. And I'm gonna put it, where, where should I put it so that I can rule out EMI? Because you said EMI. Where do I put the second sensor so I can rule out EMI? away is the answer, not near the contactor. And I do that and I put it over here and I leave about one foot of distance between where the, where the current current sensor is and the new current sensor is and what do I see? Well, it's no longer fake, right? It's real. I've put it far enough away where EMI shouldn't be a problem. I now have a spike. Now what do I do? Because I thought I fixed pre-charge. No, because it's isolated, right? Like, the, the circuit for the diode over here um, is like, like here's where the diode is, and here's where my high voltage line is. And it's isolated because the only thing that it's interacting through is the magnetic field between this coil and the switch. 
So any current that's going on in here, I'm not going to be able to see on that, on that circuit because it's not actually draining through my main line, right? What could the problem be? Yeah, let's assume it isn't. It worked, but that, that is one thing we checked. We increased the pre-charge time way up. We increased it to like 10 seconds and it still broke. Mm. Yeah, these are all things you can check, right? You can check, does, is my resistor the right value? Am I getting, I can oscilloscope the output, but I'm still, I'm still getting a current spike. And that's probably not, if my resistor worked before, it should still work n now, in like in terms of like how long, that resistor sets the pre-charge time, right? The time constant of that circuit. So if that worked like last week to pre-charge my circuit properly, my capacity, if assuming that circuit works, you can't assume the resistor, still works, but if it still works, that time should still be correct. There we go. Is my relay rated for 200 amps? Not this relay, but which relay? I just dumped, because my pre-charge circuit was broken, right? I just dumped 200 amps of current through a relay Rated for what? 40 amps. What happened? This was the fun part. This took us, I, I'm telling you, it took us six months to figure this out. Here is the Gigavac. 30 amp, 12 volt, 1200 volt contactor. 12 volt, so you might be like, why are there two voltage ratings? There's the voltage that goes to exciting the coils, and then the voltage it can actually stand off at the, like, like this voltage and this voltage. This is 12 volt, give me 12 volt, I will turn on. This is, give me more than 1200 volt, I will explode. Those are the two ratings. I have contactor, right? I turn it on, and I run 200 amps of current through a switch rated for 30 amps. What happens, Mechies, what happens right here? It arcs, but also it welds. It welds shut. So what had happened was our contactor was sitting there, welded shut for six months. How, do I, how did I figure out if the contactor was welded shut or not? Continuity check, and what did it do? What did my multimeter say? Beep. And then you fill in the blanks. My contactor had welded itself shut. How did we fix it? Replace the contactor or hit it really hard with a screwdriver. It's called percussive maintenance. You should replace your contactors, but I replaced the contactor, fixed my pre-charge circuit, my E4 is now gone. That's how you debug a system. Um, we're gonna take a five minute break. Um, when we come back, I'm gonna go through like just a couple tips for debugging. It'll take like 10, 15 minutes and then we'll end early today, um, but yes. We're gonna get started again. I don't have that much longer in terms of content. I'm just gonna go through a couple um, tips for debugging. Um, but as you can see based on this example, this cartoon is actually very accurate as to how, how it usually works. You think one thing is a problem and then it turns out to be like something very, very much different. Um, but 
especially like tying this back a little bit more to this class specifically, what you guys are gonna be doing over the next week is populating PCBs and then getting them to work, right? And that process is called bring up. In, in the electrical engineering field, we call it bringing up a board, which is from blank to working, um, how, you get, how you get something, how you get a piece of electrical hardware working. Um, so specifically, some tips while you guys are like bringing up your PCBs, because like this was a situation where we had already brought up the PCB. We were pretty confident all the connections between things. We were pretty like confident that certain parts of the circuit worked, right? Um, in terms of when you bring up an actual system, there's number one, an order in which you bring things up, and number two, things you need to consider during that bring up process that maybe you don't have to consider when you have an already working board that just suddenly broke, right? So um, one of the things I want to briefly touch on is what I'm gonna call order of population, just because we have a little time. Um, and there's a good example of this in the lecture notes, which I implore you guys to read. Um, but basically, I have a I have a big PCB. Um, maybe my audio amp is over here, my ESP32 is over here, my power supply is over here, my DAC is over here, I have some connectors over here. Which of the parts of the circuit should I populate and test first? Or should I populate everything all at once and hope for the best? Maybe start with power. Starting with power is a great idea. Um, that's what I, there's no recipe for these things, but that's what I do. So I start with the power converter, and I start with one at a time. I start with my largest power converter. My input source I know over here is gonna be a battery. Please, for the love of God, when you are bringing up a PCB that uses batteries, do not initially test your circuit with a battery, because if it's wrong, you will catch fire. You know the voltage of your battery. Don't be lazy. Get a power supply. Set it to 3.7 volts and set the current rating to something like half an amp so that you don't die. Batteries are very, very fickle creatures. They will rip your head off if you, if you do it wrong. Get a power supply. Hook it up. I promise the voltage is the same. Populate your power converter. Test the output of your power converter. So this, like the first power converter in the circuit is I think a 3.7 to 12 volt boost converter. So you populate your 12 volt boost converter and you check multimeter output. Do I get 12 volts? Yes. And then after this, you have an ESP32 which needs five volts. 3.3, 3.3 volts. You have an LDO that drops this down to 3.3 volts. It's a low dropout linear regulator. I populate my LDO. I check, am I getting 3.3 volts? Before I put my microcontroller on. Because if I put all my power electronics on and my microcontroller on at the same time, and if this is wrong, what happens to my microcontroller? Boom! And the most expensive part of my circuit has just released all of the magical blue smoke that makes it work. So don't do that. Don't do that. Go slow. There are definitely parts of the circuit you will have to populate together. That is, that is a given, right? You can't populate half a power converter. You can't populate the ESP32 without all of the surrounding like programming electronics or something because there's no way to test it if you don't populate the programmer along with that kind of stuff. But go slow, go carefully. The slower you go at the beginning, the happier you will be at the end because I promise you if you rush population, you will also rush getting exploded. And I think if you are going to be exploded, that's something you want to delay as far as possible. So. Oftentimes when I'm populating a PCB, I will look at my layout and I will sit there for like 20 minutes before I start anything. I will plan, I'm gonna start with these, then I'll do this, I'll do this. I write it down, a little checklist. 
populate test, populate test, populate test, and then slowly, patiently, you can bring up a system. If things go wrong, first, don't assume things are connected because you have just soldered it literally three seconds ago. So there is no guarantee. There, a lot of the time, honestly, 90% of my problems come from this garbage. I need a board. Um, come from this garbage where you have a, have a chip on your board and a pad and your leg and there's about 10 nanometers of distance between those two and the solder hasn't wicked under. And then what happens is this pin isn't connected and you're crying for hours because you can't figure out why your signals aren't going through your circuit because guess what, it's not connected. So, for example, if I have a chip on this side of the board and a pin, and then I don't know, a chip on the other side of the board with a pin where these things are connecting, where do I probe to make sure things are, are connected? What check do I run? Continuity, and where do you probe? You probe the pins. If you probe the pad, and you probe the pad, huge surprise, they'll be connected. Unless, unless somebody has messed up your PCB fab, which I'm telling you is also possible. It has happened before. I have routed, I just got a PCB three days ago where this happened, where there was a pin here that was connected to D5 on the microcontroller, and then a trace that goes to ground, and somehow, magically, these had ended up connected because they had drawn a trace between D5 and my, like, ground port for some reason. I was like, why am I not getting any signals? because they messed up. Most of the time, they won't. Most of the time, if they do, they'll replace it for you. But 90% of the time, you're going to probe pad to pad, and you're going to be like, well, it's connected. Because, yeah, it's connected. You told them to connect it. So pin to pin. And just because you probe it the first time, it doesn't work, doesn't mean it's not connected. Because probing pads on like, or probing the legs of a, of a chip is very difficult to get precisely down unless you have nice leads on the multimeter. So you have to sit there and you have to wiggle it for a little bit and then wiggle it until you hear a beep consistently. If it's going like beep, 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 that's not connected. You should check because what's probably happening there is you have this pad is connected and your multimeter's here and it's flexing this little leg back and forth going beep, 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 like Morse code. And that is not the definition of connected. So you want to probe lightly but carefully. Um, this is a big one. This is a big one I get anytime I talk to people who are debugging PCBs. Just because it worked yesterday doesn't mean it hasn't exploded overnight. The amount of times I have come in and a circuit that was working perfectly in the morning is now decided it's cold and upset and doesn't want to work is infinite. It will, it will just keep breaking on you until like you get it debugged to a state where it's consistent, right? There's things we don't consider. There's like uh, EMI in the room or something that's causing it to break. Slow down, be patient, check everything again, right? The first thing you should check, voltages. Is everything powered? Because also, we did spend 40 minutes debugging the solar car at one point, figuring out why wasn't the motor turning, only to realize that the e-stop was pressed. So check, check. Um, yeah, so always double check everything is powered, check your signals, check your voltages. Um, and use your experience. This is honestly, the way you get good at debugging is by debugging things. And once you've debugged something, I guarantee you that problem will come up again. Think about what was the problem last time. And also, when you debug, you will learn things about how electrical circuits go wrong, right? Use those things in your design to try to make sure it doesn't go wrong again. Oftentimes, like, Electrical engineers will find, at least in your own projects, not other people's projects, like if you do consulting, you'll see the pr same problem over and over and over again because nobody knows what a flyback diode is. But if you do like, 
your own projects, most of the time what will happen is you'll look at a PCB, you'll have 25 problems, you'll make a new PCB, and you'll have 25 brand new problems. Every problem will be new because you learn from your mistakes. You had problems here, you fix them. And now it's not a problem, and some other area of electrical engineering is gonna come out and be like, hi, I exist, or something like that. Um, yes. Uh, don't test a battery on current mode using multimeter. You can test it empirically. Your multimeter will explode. Um, yes, and there's also, there's a lot of resources on campus to get help for debugging because good news is anyone who builds a circuit has also debugged a circuit unless you're weird. Um, or you have some weird like personal debugger in your lab. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> but like MITRES, for those of you who don't know MITRES, is building it. It's an N51 group of MIT, Electronics Research Society, Makerspace, um, where a lot of like EE nerds hang out. Um, and trust me, a lot of these people have seen everything <laughs> because they have done everything. Um, we are, we are your friends, lab staff. Also people like in your classes, like lab staff and EDS um, have seen a lot of things that can help you debug. Um, yeah, in your classes. Uh, yeah, and learn from those around you because the last thing I will implore on you guys is debugging requires patience because I promise you every single electrical circuit you make will go wrong at some point. And the more you like yell at it, the less it will work. You can't get, like there is a problem, there is an answer that you can find by asking the right questions, right? So the more you scream at it, the less it's going to work for you. And I know this because I used to sit there screaming at my board, hoping that one transistor would suddenly start working and it doesn't happen. You just have to sit there. I learned very well, so one of my, my lab mentor was Elijah Stanger-Jones, for those of you who know him. He also takes out his anger by cursing at PCBs, but he's also very, he, he taught me very much that like, you need to slow down, probe, be careful, ask questions, right? Um, and think of it as a learning opportunity, right? Every single time something's gone wrong on the PCB, that means you messed something up in your design or someone has messed something up in manufacturing that you can learn from and make your designs from better in the future, right? It's a learning opportunity. So, and learning is beautiful. And that's my close. Thank you all for listening. Um, yes. Uh, sign up for design reviews, please. Thank you.